you live in the um, mortuary. I lived in the mortuary, yes, but not in the embalming room. I mean, they make it sound like, you know, I slept in the crypts with them. And I never climbed into a coffin or anything like that. That, that is so damn ridiculous. And besides, the dead won't bother you. It's the living you got to worry about. Today we're going to talk about John Wayne Gacy. His case became big in the 70s. Greg Rhodes, tell us about the videos you found. You know, this video is an interview with Ressler, who was an FBI profiler in 1992. Uh, Gacy was sentenced to death in 1980 and executed in 1994. And so this is not about him trying to get free from something. We'll use that as a frame. Give me kind of just an overview of the business that you eventually established, the, the construction work. Is this self-taught then, the, the construction <clears throat> that you eventually... So whenever the hell they're ready. Now, give me kind of just an overview of the business that you eventually established, the, the construction work. Is this self-taught so then, the, the construction <clears throat> and yeah. maintenance work? I started doing painting, and then I started doing wallpapering and decorating. And inside of three years, uh, PDM, which is painting, decorating, and maintenance, was doing a million dollars a year. And that was... And the, I only had four employees. And that was the, the business you were in at the time of the arrest. That's correct. Yeah. PDM in 1974 became a corporation, and then I owned PDM Contractors Corporation. I owned PDM Plumbing, PDM Concrete, and PDM Decorating. Mm -hmm. And then I branched off with another partner into Rafco Construction. Mm -hmm. And from there, uh, we were doing strictly drugstores. Mm -hmm. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so he jumps in on the answer there, takes that territory. Also, a sense of grandiosity there. There's all those corporations that he's had, you know, only four employers, and he had this version of the company and this version and this version. So again, a lot of taking of territory, fairly grandiose um, resume there. But at the same time, super low a blink rate. I would expect when somebody's taking that territory and they're being slightly aggressive, I would say, well, more than slightly aggressive in this kind of situation, I'd expect, expect to see other elements of aggression in his face, and yet I see nothing. Blink rate really low. I think all of that kind of speaks for itself, and we'll gradually see more and more of this very flat effect and unemotional um, uh, personality as we go through. Uh, Scott, what are your thoughts? I agree with you completely. This is sort of his baseline we're looking at here. So he's illustrating a lot with his head. That's fairly normal. Uh, his flat affect is is showing strong here, and you're right. We're going to see it throughout the throughout these videos. And quite often, this is compared to a shallow affect, which is it's not really the same thing. You have the blunt affect, and you have the there's, it seems like there's forty different thousand kinds of them. But what we're talking about at at this when we talk about that is. There's no, you don't see much emotion. In other words, it's flat or shallow, not much there when there should be things. Now here, there shouldn't be a whole lot. We're seeing it's fairly normal, normal for this situation, but that's what we're seeing here is blink, blink rate is a little bit inconsistent here, which is not odd, especially when you're just getting a baseline, but he does have those long periods of staring, which, uh, first little cue that pops up for me to go, let's watch, let's think about his personality type. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this is a great start. This is a good baseline. You both said it. Remember, this is Midwest. Midwest has a little bit different affect than Southerners or New Yorkers or any of that. So let's use that as part of his baseline. And he has that crisp telling with his chin up about all these things he did. We're going to see this guy building a profile of control. And he's starting right here talking about his life and the control in what he built. The other interesting piece is we always talk about eye movement. This is a great study in that he goes to the right for eye recall. Most of what he's doing is digital memory, meaning he said it a million times. So he's going to go right over here somewhere to pick it up. Some of it is visual. When he starts talking about wallpaper, you see his eyes dart up higher. But almost everything is, is digital, just stuff he said over and over and over. I agree with you. The blink rate is not a whole lot. I don't know if the affect is, we'll certainly see really flat affect here. I think he's just doing what he does, but I see a certain amount of control here. I also think that we're gonna see what pissed off looks like in this guy is very contained when he's not in charge. He punctuates by moving his head and he's got about 50-50 eye contact. So it looks pretty good. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you guys. It's kind of what I had in my notes here. The baseline to about the nine hour, nine o'clock as we're looking at it and then moving up to our kind of two o'clock. I think this is maybe just one for data recall. 
And I think this two o'clock position is something that you'll see again and again in his baseline for interpersonal relations when he thinks about other people. But th- what we're seeing is almost socially appropriate behavior. He's moving away while he's interrupting the person with almost polite and he's covering his mouth to cough, which is a few indicators that I would lo- be looking for how much politeness is present and how many, how much manners does this person have? So his pupils are around five millimeters in, in diameter right now. We're going to see that change in a little while. And this chest breathing, him breathing into his chest versus the abdomen, the chest is more likely to indicate stress is his baseline. So we see that in just about every video of him that's out there. So his shoulders are moving. That means he's most likely breathing into his chest. Abdominal breathing, just as a side note, means person's more relaxed, feels safer, and moves your shoulders a lot less. You can give it a shot right now. Give me kind of just an overview of the business that you eventually established, the, the construction work. Is this self-taught so then, the, the construction <clears throat> that you eventually... So whenever the hell they're ready. Now, give me kind of just an overview of the business that you eventually established, the, the construction work. Is this self-taught so I, then, the, the construction <clears throat> and yeah. maintenance work? I started doing painting and then I started doing wallpapering and decorating. And inside of three years, uh, PDM, which is painting, decorating, and maintenance, was doing a million dollars a year. And that was. And the, I only had four employees. Yeah, and that was the, the business you were in at the time of the arrests. That's correct. Yeah. PDM in 1974 became a corporation. And then I owned PDM Contractors Corporation. I owned PDM Plumbing, PDM Concrete, and PDM Decorating. Mm-hmm. And then I branched off with another partner into RAFCO Construction. Mm-hmm. And from there, uh, we were doing strictly drugstores. Mm-hmm. To go in one direction at one time. The subdivision uh, where the Summerdale house is located is built on a clay field. And when it rained, the rain would come down from both ends and would flood from, from one house to the other. The crawl space would fill up with water. In uh, 1976, I asked a landscaper, I said, what do you do for, for the, that sour odor of clay? And he said, spread white lime just regular masonry line. On the ground, he said it'll sweeten up the clay and you won't have that odor. It's sort of like what charcoal does in filtering things. That's why the line was pr- spread in the crawl space. How, how much line was spread down there eventually? Uh, I think seven or 800 pounds of it. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, if you notice, there's more concern in his brow now. He's starting to talk about something that matters. And you'll see a little bit of this brow drawn right here. These these muscles will tighten to show some concern. And you can see he's done that a fair amount in his life. He gives too much detail here. He's making a rational reason. And we always say that people slow down their illustrators when they are making up something where they're not telling the truth. But really good liars are going to use their hands. And a guy who has hidden 29 bodies has lied a few times about something. So this is a practice story, all this stuff about water running in. He's overly illustrative with his hands, shows that concern in his brow. His eyes narrow, his eyes narrow down as he gets to this point. And we're gonna see, he doesn't show outright anger, but there's places in, the, in here where you can see anger in him as he goes through here. And all the things he's saying may be true. I did ask a guy about how do you do it with a smell? And he told me lime. Well, he wasn't talking about because of water. He's talking about dead bodies under under the basement, which still be all the same stories. So he may be using real facts to cover up something. Like I always say, um, when I had lunch with Barry Menkow, he said, fraud is the skin of the truth stuffed with lies. So think of that. Watch him, too. He's drawing, pulling taffy, pulling, turning his head and keeping his eyes locked and drawing you to him. That wasn't in his baseline. So it tells me something's up. Scott, what do you got? All right. When he says built on a clay field, clay shows what some people are going to think is a micro expression of contempt or disdain. It's not. It's because his mouth doesn't work there on his right side. So he's overcompensating for that. I don't know if he's had a a stroke or a brain injury or what's going on. My thought's going to go to brain injury and I'll well, but we'll go along with that a little bit later on. So the structure of his answer has four succinct parts. And each part is a brick by brick build of the reasons why he didn't do that or couldn't have done it when he starts bringing in the part about the about the clay and that shallow affect is the part that makes this thing sound even more analytical it it, it makes him sound like he's really it, he like his vernacular is off from what he usually the way he usually talks because it's a little bit off from the way he was talking in the video we use as his baseline which was obviously his base well the baseline quite often you'll see in these situations the eyebrows will go up and and greg's saying request for approval we don't see that very much here and in something like this it should be there but it's not 
we see little brief little shots of it every now and then throughout these videos, but here it's not there. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I fully agree with you guys on this. There's something wrong with a little piece of this, and I'm, I'll dig deeper into this. But linguistically, he's using the word Somerdale House instead of my house or the house. So that he gives it an official title, something moved away from him. He's comfortable using body narration here with the rain flooding the neighborhood. He's using his body to talk about all this. He's illustrating that. And then he says, that's why the lime was in the crawl space. And right here we have a postural retreat, which is when he kind of leaned back uh, away from the interviewer. They have lip compression and we have a chin boss movement all on. That's why the lime was in the space. And then it goes to how much lime again, and he's right back to genuine stuff. There's genuine eye movement recall at his baseline. He gives an estimated number. People who are lying are more likely to give a smaller range or to show a little more doubt. And then there's nodding right after the number. He nods his head. So I think there's truth, deception, and then truth here, which is just a little uh, ham sandwich of deception. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, so I think he wasn't expecting the quantity question because we do get a, a shift in his baseline about when he normally tells a story. He, he's he's kind of overly helpful. It's full of almost kind of bureaucratic analysis of 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 the topography, the geography of it. We don't really need any of that. But he gets into that, and then his eyes shift when he's asked the the quantity question. He gives an er, uh, which we haven't had from him before. He's usually very controlled around the way he delivers. There's some lip retraction there, a vocal click, blink rate goes up, and and I think those nods are nods for approval. I ju I'm not suggesting he's 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 lying, just like you, Chase. Uh, but I think it's it's a good baseline for when he hasn't rehearsed the story. On, on this. Could be genuine information, but not anything he was thinking of getting. Now, I think on that's why the line was spread in the crawl space, uh, uh, as well as what you saw there, Chase, I think I see delight. Now, I'm not saying Jupiter's delight. That would be something very different, but slow down those frames there and just see whether you can see some kind of, of, of glint of, of delight or joy. It's very, very subtle. Um, but it's interesting because I wonder what that delight is is about. If I've read that right, what is that delight about? Uh, he's an odd fellow, isn't he? To go in one direction at one time. The subdivision uh, where the Somerdale house is located is built on a clay field. And when it rained, the rain would come down from both ends and would flood from, from one house to the other. The crawl space would fill up with water. In uh, 1976, I asked a landscaper, I said, what do you do for, for the, that sour odor of clay? And he said, spread white lime, just regular masonry lime. On the ground, he said, it'll sweeten up the clay and you won't have that odor. It's sort of like what charcoal does in filtering things. That's why the lime was spread in the crawl space. How, how much lime was spread down there eventually? Uh, I think seven or 800 pounds of it. John, how about uh, Tim McCoy, the last one of the five that you say you have personal knowledge of? Tim McCoy, even though he's the last one, he's the first one. He's the first one, actually. Right. The first of the 33. Tim Tim McCoy was, was the first one, and uh, Tim McCoy's name wasn't put on him until 1988. Prior to that, he was known as Unknown Number 9, mm -hmm. and he was buried by me in the crawl space. Mm -hmm. That's the only knowledge that I have of it. What was the circumstances of that? He was killed in the house uh, in self-defense. And who killed him then? I stabbed him. Yeah, and it was a, a an issue of self-defense. Why, why was was he in the process of assaulting you, or, or what? He was coming at me with a knife. I just took the knife away and twisted it in his hand, and that that's what killed him. Mm -hmm. So, so at, at, at that point, uh, you you yourself did bury him then in the crawl space, right? And if you if you notice, he's under concrete. Did, did you bury any of the others in the crawl space? No, I had nothing. To, I, I had no knowledge of them. Yeah. Well, why why is it that yours your, your first one is there, and then you know twenty some uh, others are, are buried down there as well? Did somebody know that you had done this with the first one, that giving them an idea? More than likely, when drinking and getting high with the others, yeah. Admitting it to them. 
So you feel others then followed your suit in, in uh, using this as a burial ground? Without a doubt. Yeah. Chase, what do you got? Right off the bat, he was buried by me in the crawl space. This is distancing language. If I did something, I would say I buried him in the crawl space. And then it, it goes to, that's the only knowledge that I have of it. It. It's a strange worst word usage here, but th there's also a head tilt, which is unusual for his baseline. I think he is likely to do this during his deceptive statements. There's an immediate withdrawal of his head, kind of pulls back away from the interviewer, and the eyes dart to emotional recall right away when he's saying this. And there's a contempt micro expression right at that moment, right at that exact moment. You'll see contempt there. What I think is a contempt micro expression. Scott may bury me under the floorboards for saying that, but <laughs> <laughs> then there's a swallow and fading facts all in the exact same thing. And when he's talking about he was killed in the house, not I killed him. There's more distancing language, another head tilt. There's lip retraction. There's chin boss movement, which is grief or shame. And then it, it continues on with this distancing language. That's what killed him. And I'm sure you guys will get the other ones here. Uh, I don't want to uh, take it of everything. But why is it that the first one is there and some 20 others, you know, the interviewer goes through this question. There's a postural retreat. And the hand disappears below the table in what I think is genital protection, which is a fear behavior. And I think there's a possibility that the story is actually true. I think there's a possibility that that person was in his house unwillingly and maybe tried to escape and maybe did come after him with a knife, which would still help his little self-defense story. Or maybe he tried to escape and he called it self-defense, but he never talks about how that person got into his house. He just says, he came at me with a knife. If someone breaks into your house, we'll say some dude kicked in my door and started demanding to where's the jewelry, where's the money. No, he just came at me with a knife. So I think maybe there was an attempted escape uh, with that one before he learned some of his uh, psychopath lessons. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, this one is probably the one I'm going to be longest winded on because I have three pages of notes. This is probably the worst of the entire thing. He starts off, like you said, everything is passive. Everything is passive. If you look, he starts off with some kind of lip compression at the very beginning of it. Something is up there. Don't know which question started it. It's interesting that when Wrestler asks him about all 33, he doesn't protest it at all. He lets it slide by. If I killed two people and was really, really adamant I killed two people, I'd say I didn't kill 33, I killed two. But he doesn't. He just lets it pass. What we're going to see here is a pattern of a guy who has gotten so odd that everything's okay and normal, and he can talk about it kind of casually. If tomorrow, Chase, you decide you're going to start drinking cooking oil, in a month, cooking oil drinking would be normal, and you'd talk to people about it. It's wonderful. It tastes like this. This guy killed 29 people, 29, and buried them in his basement, most of them. Some of them he buried under his driveway and could even tell you exactly how they were lying. The story, if you go watch these interviews, is fantastic. I mean, it's a horrible story, but it's a fantastic bunch of police work. He says was killed, passive, was buried, and he distances and uses passive in that case, was buried by me. That's the only knowledge I have of it. I got the same thing. Disdain shows when he does, that's the only knowledge I have of it. I think in, in some case, he's disappointed in that he didn't get away with it or something. Something's showing because there's disdain and then there's shame. So whatever was there, he was killed in the house in self-defense. In this one, I think I see anger. I see lip withdrawal, but I also see a narrowing of the mouth and the lower whites of his eyes show. That's anger. That upper lid is down and the lower lid is lower. That's anger. And when you see that in somebody who is not in control, imagine what it would be if they were in control is the way I look at this guy. Then that chin boss shows up again. There's another lip compression. And there's just a bunch of complex emotions flooding his face that we haven't seen here. He says, I stabbed him. His lips rise just a bit. And then he stopped. If you stop the video right there, Mark, back to your amusement. If you stop the video right there and pause it, there's pleasure in his face. You can see amusement. When he was asked um, questions about self-defense, his eyes went down right. And then he didn't move his eyes at all when he was shaking his head. He was locked on this guy's eyes and pulling his eyes around his head as he moved. Um, I took it away. I'll, I'll leave that one alone. You get when he says, I took it away and I spun it around him and stabbed him. You get a chin jut in defiance. And then he sounds like 
<laughs> it's an ordinary shooting weekend. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I buried him under concrete. Well, well, obviously anybody I killed, I buried under concrete. So the rest of those guys are not mine. I'm not sloppy. I'm a controlled guy. I build things for a living. I got other stuff. I'll leave it there because there's just so much in that one passage that I could go on probably another 10 minutes. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. It's all very controlled. You know, if you look, it's in the manual. This is how I, I did it, if you care to look. So it's incredibly bureaucratic. There he is with that almost kind of telephone directory size, um, I don't know, manual, um, uh, dictionary of 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 murder, essentially. Um, lots of numbers. He comes up with lots of numbers. So it really is, you know, an accountancy of what went on at the same time i i agree kind of lets the 30 the, the 30 odd people slide when it's put forward but what's odd for me is he he doesn't own up to it he does let it slide through i'm still confused at this point as why he's denying uh the murder of some of these people i don't quite get that other than he's really odd he's really odd and he's decided that he's gonna own up to some and deny some my guess is is that changes over you probably get him in another interview and he's now owning up to some and denying some others I'm, I'm guessing it could change on a on a weekly monthly yearly basis for him as to what how he's going to perform in these situations the, the main thing for me is that we do see some fleeting emotions around his face of of anger delight i would agree greg around the killing what we don't see is fear or sorrow and and again that classifies him within a, a psychology for sure if if i talked about harming somebody uh certainly killing you would probably see some elements of fear or or or, uh, or sorrow around that because um you know i have a socially primed brain part of my brain knows ah, it's kind of wrong to do that that stuff you couldn't know you might kind of shouldn't it's wrong i would pretty much guarantee he doesn't have the same feelings around around that uh scott what do you think all right we'll start with chase chase uh, i agree with you where, where the severity softening language was he he was buried by me not i buried him he's he's moved himself away from that i'm gonna have a problem with with most everybody here on the part where he shows disdain or contempt because after he says that's the knowledge I, that's all the knowledge i have that's the only knowledge i have of it and it looks like contempt but it's not it's regret but it's modified by the paralysis of the right side of his mouth now the clinical psychopath has no feelings of remorse or dead or sadness or whatever this behavior is seen when you see someone who has damage to the amygdala where they've been in a car wreck been hit in the head with a shovel been uh, hit by a car those kind of things something's happened to this guy where that's happened because his behavior like mark was saying is odd you keep saying he's an odd guy he's odd because he has damage to his amygdala i bet a thousand I, all of it all my chips go on that now when that happens that's when you see this odd behavior because they're right next to being normal they're right next to being normal but you see this dramatic drop off from normality to just the freakiest stuff you can possibly imagine which is what he comes which is what he does is what he gets into so we're seeing lip compression right and left here now what appears to be lip lip compression after he said killed in self-defense is anger you got the you nailed that greg of course you would i don't mean to be i'm not complimenting you i don't need to compliment you good job greg uh but so yeah so this but that's normal lip compression at that point um for that and again that goes back to the psychopath was damaged has damage to the amygdala not a classic psychopath now the severity softening language on i just took the knife away and twisted it in his hand and that's what killed him doesn't say for the second time where he could i stabbed him well if he took it away from him it was in his he said i took it away from him and it was in his hand so we've got two things there that just don't that doesn't work you can't take it away from him and have it in his hand and twist it and him be dead so he stabbed me with that so there's a lot going on there but i think what we're looking at here is somebody who's got damage to the amygdala but it's not it's not the in the nature versus nurture um fight over are psychopaths born or are they created this one was created i don't know when but he was created john how about uh, tim mccoy the last one of the five that you say you have personal knowledge of him? tim mccoy even though he's the last one he's the first one he's the first one actually right the first of the 33. tim tim mccoy was was the first one and uh Tim McCoy's name wasn't put on him until 1988.
prior to that, he was known as unknown number nine. Mm -hmm. And he was buried by me in the crawl space. Mm -hmm. That's the only knowledge that I have of it. What was the circumstances of that? He was killed in the house uh, in self-defense. And who killed him then? I stabbed him. Yeah, and it was a, a ma an issue of self-defense. Why, why was, uh, was he in the process of assaulting you or, or what? He was coming at me with a knife. I just took the knife away and twisted it in his hand and that, that's what killed him. Mm -hmm. So, so at, at, at that point, uh, you, you yourself did bury him then in the crawl space. Right, and if you if you notice, he's under concrete. Did, did you bury any of the others in the crawl space? No, I had nothing. To, I, I had no knowledge of them. Yeah. Well, why why is it that yours your, your first one is there, and then you know twenty some uh, others are, are buried down there as well? Did somebody know that you had done this with the first one, that giving them an idea? More than likely, when drinking and getting high with the others, yeah. Admitting it to them. So you feel others then followed your suit in, in uh, using this as a burial ground? Without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, and you took him where? Out on the I-55 bridge. And that's where, uh, how was he then taken from the car and placed into the into the river? Just opened up the trunk and dumped him in. Mm -hmm. Okay. There, was, there was no, there was no big special deal on yeah. it. I couldn't get down in the crawl space that easy, and then I had a bum back to begin with. You got to crawl on your belly to move around in the crawl space. There is no way that I could have done any of the digging down there. I had enough trouble just getting down there. Greg, what do you got? I, I'm going to be real short on this one. This is a normal guy talking. If you're not paying attention, you just think, okay, this is a normal guy talking, except for what he's talking about. Again, this has become so normal to him. He, oh, yeah, I had a quart of cooking oil this morning with my cereal. That's what's going on. This guy's gotten so freaking weird and so criminal that it's just normal for him to talk about this stuff. Look at his dominant eye. We always say your dominant eye is what you shoot with and it's where you do most of your data intake. Look at that dominant eye shrinking. He's pissed at this guy. And if you can see, you can't see it in his face. You can see he's starting to get a little hostile. You see his face starting to wrench around a little. And then the thing that you're going to pay attention to from here on out is when he's feeling that kind of anger or hostility, his eyes dart down into his right. Boom, 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 boom. And I think what you're doing is you're tapping into the anger, some emotion you're tapping into, but we're seeing that reflection. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So again, I think he says the I ninety four then there for the for the bridge. Again, it's it's bureaucratic. Um, it's it's numbers. It's it's uh, things, not feelings. Um, zero feeling on 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 the bridge there. I mean, why would you have a feeling? It's the I ninety four bridge. It's it's a thing. But then when we get to crawling on your belly and uh, in order to dig holes to bury people, which he says he didn't, he couldn't possibly have done. Again, it's it's um, it's bureaucratic in the way that he's going through it. Blink rate is maybe a touch higher on that. And then he breaks that with a little bit of laughter. We'll see a lot more laughter later on. I think that's, that's going to be seen as an indicator of he's being dishonest and he breaks the tension that's building up around that, that dishonesty with some laughter. I think we see it here. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I, I agree with him. Having seen a few details of this, I don't quite see how you dig holes underneath there. But, you know, this is clearly somebody who could do anything he likes. So I'm, I don't think it's beyond him to, to dig, uh, you know, 30 centimeter holes, the deep holes or whatever it was underneath uh, in a very thin space. I think where there's a will, there's a, there's a way. And I think he's got the will and he's got the, the way around that. Uh, Chase, what do you think? Yeah, right away, the interviewer asked, you took him where? And then we see the exact thing from the first video that we looked at with the baseline. We see the nine o'clock for data and then two o'clock for what I, in my opinion, labeled some kind of interpersonal recall or visual recall. And he's saying, there's no way I could have done the digging. And this is the exact opposite of his normal eye movement. He goes to three o'clock when he usually goes to nine. And there's a non-contraction, which is also outside of his baseline. There's no way I could have instead of could have. He contracts everything that he possibly can in his normal speech. And this crawl space was actually pretty damn big. If you look at any of the police photos of this crawl space, which I do not recommend uh, that you do, but it's, it's pretty big. There's some people that are almost standing all the way up down there. 
And him denying the crimes because of the size of the crawl space is like an English prince denying a crime because of a lack of an ability to sweat. Just as an example. That is never that would never happen. That's bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> but in in reality, we're missing denial. We are missing a full denial in this entire thing. Every denial is soft and couched. And the denial is about getting in the crawl space. And the denial is never about, I did not kill those people. There's no strong, confident denial. There's not even a partially confident denial. Scott, what do you got? All right. So far, the most eyebrow movement uh, we've seen throughout this is here. We see more than anywhere else up to this point. But he's using short, on-point sentences. And this, but this is where, like Greg always says, I'd go, I'd go deeper in here because something's just not right about this, about what he's talking about there. Something just sounds odd in there. I'm not sure quite what it is, but it sounds like something needs, you need more, ask more questions around that. His, his blink rate's really low. And that's, you see that quite often with somebody who's lying to you. The reason being their brain wants to keep an eye on you to make sure you believe them. So everybody always says, and we always talk about this. When somebody lies to you, the, the biggest myth is, oh, they broke eye contact, so I know they, li- they were lying. Nope. Quite often, they know you think that, so they won't do it. Number two and number one, their brain wants to keep an eye on you to make sure you believe them. So when they start adding qualifiers, if you pause after, your, after they give you the first answer, and they start adding qualifiers to that, there are more reasons to why that what they're saying is true, then they'll, they'll be able to watch you and keep an eye on you at the same time. So... Uh, his cadence is a lot faster here. His voice tone is a little bit higher. He's a little bit louder. However, at the end there where he says, um, there's no way I could have done the digging down there. We you hear fading facts where he says down there. Now, keep in mind, this guy had a construction company. So if you think for one second, he didn't know, how, he's talking about, he's used concrete in a construction company. Greg will be able to tell you, he'd run one of those. You have, you, you know about concrete. You know how to use it. You know how to dig a hole and put somebody in it and use concrete to fill it up. I think I, I think this guy is just slowly but surely he's telling us everything without telling us everything. And you took him where? Out on the I-55 bridge. And that's where. Uh, how was he then taken from the car and placed into the into the river? Just opened up the trunk and dumped him in. Mm-hmm. Okay. There, was, there was no, there was no big special deal. On yeah. it. I couldn't get down in the crawl space that easy, and then I had a bum back to begin with. You got to crawl on your belly to move around in the crawl space. There is no way that I could have done any of the digging down there. I had enough trouble just getting down there. Now, when the when the search warrants were affected in your case, uh, they did they did find an awful lot in the crawl space of your home, did they not? Well, yeah, I, yeah. I had offered to sell them the house because yeah. I I thought there was nothing down in the crawl space. Yeah. I had never. Uh, had any qualms about them going down in the crawl space. Well, how many bodies were actually lo- located on the property and where? To my understanding, there was a total of 29 bodies or 28 bodies mm-hmm. were found on the property. 26, 27 of them under the house. And the rest? One was under the driveway, one was under the garage. So that, that makes a total of 29. Okay. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, it's a really simple, this one. Lots of concern there, lots of nodding of the head, lots of trying to be helpful and trying to be very helpful again with the mathematics here. Again, see how he's very much into categories of things, numbering things, and not into any of the feelings that might happen around people. Again, super low blink rate as well. He's an odd chap. That's all I got. Chase, what do you think? Yeah, he shifts to internal dialogue during the question with his eyes, which is kind of down here or down here. And the eyes move down in that direction for internal dialogue when we are rehearsing something or planning something. So he's planning his answer as the question is being completed before it's completed. Then we see lip licking. Both are preparation for presentation. I'll just call them both of that. So this lip licking is kind of a hygienic gesture that subconsciously, a lot of what we talk about is un, we don't ever mention it. We don't mention it often enough, but these are unconscious behaviors that a person's not thinking about. So just making the person look a little bit better, licking the lips, adjusting the hair, picking imaginary lint. Those are all semi-hygienic gestures. But when he says, I offer to sell them the house, it's a difference between I didn't know there were bodies and I thought there was nothing. I didn't know there were any bodies in the house or I thought there was nothing down there. There's a big difference between those two phrases. 
And when he finally mentions the bodies, there's a progressive head tilt back to his, his base, his deception baseline, progressive head tilt. There's a contempt, I think, still facial expression of contempt at 29. And I think there's genuine recall to the locations of the bodies. We see the eyes move to when he's thinking about where all of these bodies were laid out. Granted, if he was innocent and he'd been through, I don't know, 700 hours of going through court and trial prep and all this stuff, he'd probably still do genuine recall to the locations of the body. So I just will, I will say that. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this guy's getting pissed. What I see here is he wants to interject, but he's going, I I don't see, he's very controlled because he knows he has no control in the situation. People who exercise this kind of control over other people, strangle them to death and that kind of thing. They have, they're not going to be as open about their aggression with average people, and especially sitting across from an FBI agent. But I think I see frustration. I see him wanting to say something and defend himself. There's a narrowing of his eyes just as that blink rate increases. And I see disgust or disdain or contempt or something. You can't tell for sure. I mean, he's got kind of a weird sideways thing, but there's withdrawing of his lips back. Mark, you would call it a bitter taste. There's withdrawing of his lips back at 29. I think it's more about how he's perceived is what we're seeing here. There are likely signs at his loss of control of the situation. And this guy's pushing him around. And I, you see that lip, lip licking is a way of controlling frustration to me. It's controlling emotion. That downright eye movement is, is emotion again. And this guy, I would just about bet you, is really hot-headed to deal with. And, you know, when they were doing their drugs or whatever, we know that he was violent, clearly. When you can kill 33 people, because they're talking about 29 buried on the property, but 33 people killed. And there's some math associated with, he was Pogo the Clown for 33 Flavors ice cream place. And when they ask him, he says, that's kind of ironic, uh, that kind of thing. So it's it's a really interesting, twisted story. Scott, what do you got? All right. His cadence, his cadence and tone are still up. He still, he still sounds excited, but I agree with you, Greg. He's trying to hold back that anger at this point. And he gives a reason to, he gives reasoning to, to how he had no, no knowledge of what happened or no knowledge of that. This isn't unusual, but it's just kind of off and off right here. And that's, that's, that's where I think more questions should be asked. I think right there, if, if you were, this is an interrogation, he's just talking to the guy, just interviewing him. But that's where you jump in and start asking more questions and almost start pushing him around to get that stuff out of him. Um, the structure of that answer, that's a red flag. But again, not an interrogation, just an interview. So the end is an, is an expression of contempt. That's where it stops there. A lot of people are going to think, ah, there's a lot more there. But it's lip compression under stress. And it's it, it looks like I said it looks like contempt. It's not contempt. So uh, he still got that problem with the right side of his mouth, and I think that that's a lot of what we're seeing with that because he tries to over overreact when he's or overcompensate when he's saying the uh, vowel a and words with a in it. It seems like he's he's overdoing it there. But I think at the end there we see that lip compression due to stress. I know uh, in this case. Um, I think he got hit in the head with something. Oh wait, you did say that, didn't you, Chase? He got hit. What? What happened to his? What did he get hit with? A swing? It was a swing. Uh, when he was ten or eleven, he suffered a traumatic brain injury. M- okay. MTBI, mild, mild. Now, when the when the search warrants were affected in your case, uh, they did they did find an awful lot in the crawl space of your home, did they not? Well, yeah, I, yeah. I had offered to sell him the house because yeah. I I thought there was nothing down in the crawl space. Yeah. I had never. Uh, had any qualms about them going down in the crawl space. Well, how many bodies were actually lo- located on the property and where? To my understanding, there was a total of 29 bodies or 28 bodies mm-hmm. were found on the property. 26, 27 of them under the house. And the rest? One was under the driveway, one was under the garage. So that, that makes a total of 29. Okay. John, the media has, has, has called you a homosexual killer. What is your position on homosexuality? I have nothing against it. I'm a, I'm an outspoken liberal. I don't care for uh, the uh, the labeling. I don't care for any labeling for that fact. Do you I claim mean, to I, be I've a, been, do you claim no, homosexuality? No, I I would uh, definitely not be mm-hmm. homosexual. Uh, I have nothing against what they do, and I I don't deny that uh, I've engaged in sex with males, but that I'm bisexual. You're bisexual? Right. 
I my preference is women, mm -hmm. and I've been married enough times and, and have children, and mm -hmm. uh, I see nothing wrong with it. Uh, Chase, want to go first? Sure. So he grew up with a tremendous shame around his sexuality, and he grew up in an extremely abusive household, physically abusive, psychologically abusive. And when the words homosexual killer come out, you'll see lip pursing and you'll see contempt. And right after this, you'll see perfect unilateral facial movement, which to me, in my opinion, would indicate that there's perfect bilateral uh, facial movement here in, in both sides of the face. But when he said, when the interviewer says, do you claim homosexuality? Uh, he's saying he doesn't like labels. Uh, and then he calls himself an outspoken liberal, which is a label. But right at this part where he's talking about, do you claim homosexuality? We see an eyebrow flash. We see emotional eye accessing down into the emotional part of his visual field. We have vocal hesitancy, which is uncharacteristic for him. We have word repetition, which is uncharacteristic for him. We have distancing language when he said would not be. And there's more another right towards the end of this response. There's a micro emotional accessing where his eyes just dart down to that really quick. And I think at the moment we see bisexual, I think we see a contempt facial expression. And when he says, I see nothing wrong with it, we see the classic single shoulder shrug, which is uncharacteristic for him and suggests that a person disagrees with what they're saying or lacks confidence in, in something that they're saying there. And that's all I got there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. So the logic that he has there of, of often saying he's he's not A and A at the same time is, is what I might call a frustrated logic. If you try and follow his pattern there, it's just frustrating. You get frustrated with it. You go, how are you saying this and not this at the same time? How are you... Um, uh, how are you saying that there are no categories at all and then using categories? I think it's um, emblematic of the internal frustration that he has. He has a huge frustration with how others and himself are categorizing his sexuality. That I would chance my arm is where the violence comes from and it's coming out in this bizarre logic that he has. We'll see it later on as well, where he does an A and not A category at the same time. You can't have both, but he can. He does have both. He does try and have both at the same time. And my guess is he has to manipulate the world around him in all kinds of ways by potentially putting on all kinds of costumes in order to make these things fit. And when because um, essentially what, what we have here, when, when you say, um, I don't like categories at all, there are no categories, essentially you get a breakdown of society. You get antisocial behaviors because there just are no categorical rules anymore. As long as you've got built up around that kind of personality, some things to keep it in place, some moderators, because they might, might not have their own great moderators, but if they're still maybe in a marriage and they've still got friends or society around them enough, they'll probably, the society around them will moderate them enough. But when those fall away, you could get that surge of frustration born out in anger and violence and potentially a succession of, of murders along the way, which is, I think, what we get here. Uh, anyway, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so we know his point of shame. Whether he should be ashamed or not, he's, this is something he's ashamed of, because if he were not, he would not be trying at all turns to avoid it. And that's exactly what we see here. The first real blink rate increase we've really seen, his blink rate goes through the roof on this, and his head is moving a hell of a lot more than it did in the past videos. He doesn't complete sentences. He starts editing as he speaks. When he's asked, are you a homosexual killer? There's a quick eye contact staring dead down the camera to see how that guy perceived that that one comment. And then you see him moving differently. His head's more glitchy. He does downright. And when he says, I would definitely downright, we associate with emotion. Chase, you brought up the emotional accessing piece. When he looks down into his right, we associate that with emotional eye accessing. And then he does distancing language. I would definitely not be homosexual. And then he said, I don't deny that internal voice down to his left as he thinks about how to say this in the least damaging fashion. 
There's a long pause, and then he goes, I engaged in sex with males. Forget all the rest. This tells you that killing, he's okay with talking about killing. But homosexuality, he's not willing to say he's a homosexual because he also likes sex with women. That's as good as he can get to get away from the thing that he's most ashamed or hurt by. And Mark probably, I, I'm, I'm not the psychologist on this. I bet he's been studied like a, like a lab rat. And they know what his, you know, his fracture points and all those things were. So that's what I got. Scott, what do you got? Uh, I, I, yeah, it looks, y'all have covered everything. I'm going to go back over all that stuff. I don't think he's hiding a whole lot here. He is some things and he separates himself, um, distance himself, distances himself from homosexuality. That's all we got. That's, and that's basically a nutshell what everybody said there. John, the media has, has, has called you a homosexual killer. What is your position on homosexuality? I have nothing against it. I'm, a, I'm an outspoken liberal. I don't care for uh, the, uh, the labeling. I don't care for any labeling for that fact. Do you I claim, mean, to I, be I've a, been, do you claim no. homosexuality? No, I, I would uh, definitely not be mm -hmm. homosexual. Uh, I have nothing against what they do, and I, I don't deny that uh, I've engaged in sex with males, but that I'm bisexual. You're bisexual? Right. I My preference is women, mm -hmm. and I've been married enough times and, and have children, and mm -hmm. uh, I see nothing wrong with it. The clowning was relaxation for me. I enjoyed entertaining kids. Like some people are, uh, you know, they... They unwind in different ways, either either by going out drinking or that. I could put on clown makeup and I was relaxed, and I, mean, I enjoyed doing it. I it was uh, they, I, twice. They, it was only twice a month that I did yeah, it. Yeah, this I was, was not used then for a lure to to draw kids to you. Is is uh, no? We would visit uh, different hospitals and uh, entertain the children there, and we didn't entertain them with handcuffs or anything like that. All we used was uh, balloon animals and small toys and stuff like that. But we also did parades. And in the summertime, like on 4th of July, I used to be in four parades in one day. I've always told people when, when I got into clown makeup, I regressed into childhood. It was fun being a clown because you could you, you could be yourself or, or just let yourself go and act a fool. You could be slapstick and funny and have a good time. That's why I always enjoyed clowning. Clowning has taken a bad name I, because of what they've used in my case. All right, I've gone last in the last four, so I'll go first on this one. His voice tone and cadence, cadence are relaxed and smooth. It's a little bit fast, a bit, but I think that's because clowning excites him because that's one of the things he really likes, or apparently the thing that really got him relaxed or got him mellowed out. See, so he's stressed mouth when he's interrupted by, that, by the guy talking to him uh, in the middle of that discussion about one of his favorite things and it's it's a little bit more than a hint of anger as he as we see the lip compression there but just before the lips compress that's when we see the we see the uh, both lips tightening and just a hint up here uh, of uh, going up showing anger um, then he compares using handcuffs he's talking about little children and going to entertain kids but he uses handcuffs juxtaposed against balloons that's it yeah, that's that's odd it goes back to that shallow affect we talked about earlier whereas it's he sees no it doesn't bother him to be talking about handcuffs and things he used to murder people with or in in those events and balloons and children at the same time um that's all i got uh chase what do you got you never heard of the old handcuffs in the hospital with kids routine <laughs> yeah, yeah it's a classic yeah but nobody remembers it <laughs> nobody remembers that <laughs> When when the interviewer says, "Are you going to lure? Are you doing this to lure kids to you?" His adapting increases. To use Greg and Scott's word, where he's starting to adjust papers on the table with both hands, and we also see some chin boss movement here, where this muscle comes up. Grief or shame is what we see with that. And when he says different hospitals, we're trying to land at different hospitals. He shifts to using team pronouns, team focused. He says we went around to different hospitals and we did this. This is softening and socializing the visits because there's a team at play here. It's not just me. Other people did this. But then when he talked about four parades in one day, he shifts back to the self pronouns. 
And this shift can sometimes indicate where shame is hiding or where guilt is felt most. Somebody goes into a team pronoun, like uh, lots of people did this, so it's widely accepted. That's where you see hidden shame or hidden guilt. And when he was talking about regressing into childhood, he says, I always tell people, this is a phrase people use when they're unwilling to say it now, and they have to quote some kind of past behavior. The, then we see an eyebrow flash to the interviewer, which is a request for approval. It's the biggest one yet, I think. His hands get more animated here. And I think there's actual enjoyment on the face for dressing up in, in clown and, and making people happy. I, I do think he derives some enjoyment from that. And he's saying clowning's taken a bad name. This is a perfect example of last minute shift to internal dialogue to process what to say right before he says clowning or clowning's taking a bad name. And then he's talking about how his case affected it. It definitely did. Yeah, I think Stephen King wrote a book off of this uh, potentially. And this is the internal dialogue shift that you'll see a, a micro shift down and to his right, or I'm uh, sorry, to, to your right. And as a fun fact, to wrap up my little thing here, his last meal in prison was Kentucky Fried Chicken and a pound of strawberries. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm not going to cover a lot because you covered a lot of it. That great big request for approval you can't miss when he's doing that. The one where he does right eye access. And remember, every time he was recalling something about his construction company, he's looking over here, whether it's rote, digital memory, or something auditory. I'm sure he found some really tough visual cue and it went up here. When he's talking about those handcuffs, his eyes went to the right. That makes me a little concerned, whether it's with children or some other way that that came up in his mind. The other one I would say is this. I love dogs. I got a pack of dogs at all times. Dogs roll in dead animals. You know why they do that? So they don't smell like a predator and they can sneak up on things. People who do really grandiose behaviors, like I met Rosalind Carter, I'm doing this, I'm doing, I'm always looking behind the curtains on those guys just to say, wait a minute, not saying all people that do that are bad guys, but it's a really easy way to hide if you roll around and stuff and you look like and smell like other people, then they trust you. I'm careful with that. And when I see that clowning got a bad name, you're dead on Chase. I watch that internal dialogue. He's trying to think of something positive to say to come out of this mess because there's nothing positive he can say about what he did. That's the whole truth. And all that good stuff that he did has now been taken down. He probably did do good things for kids. At the same time, he's murdering teenage boys. It's just the way it goes. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think there may well be an element there, Greg, of hidden in plain sight. Um, uh, and we've seen that with others who are serial of, uh, offenders, um, that that immersing yourself in an entertainment role, and especially around charity, is a great way to deflect and distract from what's really going on. Of course, I'm, I'm talking about Savile that we may touch on at some point. Um, so, uh, yeah, I agree with you as well, Greg. There's that look to the side on, and we didn't entertain them with handcuffs or anything like that. Uh, look to the side, and I see delight as well. You're right, Chase, it could be delight for, and a general delight about the enjoyment of, of being a clown. I think his enjoyment is probably about the release of playing a role, the enjoyment of that release. As he says, you know, uh, you can... You can be a fool without penalty. My guess is, is there was a penalty for being a fool back when he was a kid. This is a chance for him to be a fool in front of society and there is no penalty. His dad is not going to, uh, you know, hit him around being stupid. Um, so there's freedom and, and release. And of course, the costume helps him transgress the usual social rules. Remember in the circus, the clowns are the things that come out of the circus ring. They get right in the audience with their buckets of water and slop and glitter and and the lions and the really dangerous things there they stay within that within that uh, that circle so clowns are always known for transgressing the usual social rules and ultimately this is what he he does he transgresses the usual social rules of what you might what you might do with your sexual energy repressed sexual energy if you have no boundaries on it anymore and it turns into the the monstrous uh lineup of, of murders that he commits i would imagine that he potentially used other manipulative roles other roles 
around these murders, not necessarily a clown, but but other role play in order to manipulate people um, into situations where they would they would accept as being normal something that isn't normal that is antisocial or something antisocial about to happen i'm not quite sure how he how he got people into positions where i mean to murder 30 odd people you, you gotta have a system you gotta have a you know you gotta have some kind of system my guess is there was some kind of role play that went on there as well and being a clown would be a great way to practice that great way to see you know if i dress up in this costume if i do these kind of things how am i accepted how can i do things that aren't normally acceptable in general society the clowning was relaxation for me i enjoyed entertaining kids like some people are uh, you know they they unwind in different ways either either we're going out drinking or that i could put on clown makeup and i was relaxed and I enjoyed doing it. I it was uh, it, twice. A, it was only twice a month that I did yeah, it. Yeah, this I was, was not using for a lure to to draw kids to you, as as the... no. We would visit uh, different hospitals and uh, entertain the children there, and we didn't entertain them with handcuffs or anything like that. All we used was uh, balloon animals and small toys and stuff like that. But we also did parades, and in the summertime, like on Fourth of July, I used to be in four parades in one day. I've always told people when, when I got into clown makeup, I regressed into childhood. It was fun being a clown because you could you, you could be yourself or, or just let yourself go and act a fool. You could be slapstick and funny and have a good time. That's why I always enjoyed clowning. Clowning has taken a bad name I, because of what they've used in my case. Uh, just to, just want to highlight on... on uh, John Zick, you know, they want they want to make such an issue over John Zick mm -hmm. and his disappearance. I think he was killed for his car personally. And your and your personal knowledge of this of the Zick uh, uh, case then is uh, is uh, my what? personal knowledge of the Zick case is, is that I had come home and Zick and Rossi were at the house. I had a few drinks. I went to bed. When I woke up the the next morning, Rossi was sleeping on the couch and Zick was dead on the floor. I went about my own business, and he was gone later on. And where, where did he go? Where did he end up? I assumed he ended up in the crawl space. You, did you see him being transported down there? No, wasn't present. Didn't do the didn't do the transporting. But when he was dead, he was dead on the floor. He was dead on the floor. Yes. And did you have in conversation with anybody about that? No. In other words, I just uh, I just kept my mouth shut because I didn't want to get involved. Mm -hmm. My idea was to just stay out of it. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a creepy, creepy one. Not like the restaurant, but when he talks about the guy, he starts off with kind of some lip movement. He's agitated. He stutters and stammers a bit. One of the more interesting things that we see in this video is hiding time without ever verbal bridging. It is a beautiful hiding time. I went to bed. I got up. The body was there. Never said, he said he went to bed. He never said there were any fighting or anything else. He never said that he didn't kill him. He simply said, when I got up, the body was on the floor. And then that is a beautiful case of, of hiding time, just a way to avoid it. Um, when he says, if you watch him, he's eye blocking in the middle of that. And then when he says, I went about my business, watch that request for approval. We didn't see it earlier, but we certainly see it now. And Scott, I'm gonna steal one of yours. He does the chicken moving his head and his eyes staying locked the whole time. His eyes don't leave at all. He's doing the romance where he's eye locking, trying to make sure the guy's paying attention to the things he wants him to. And watch, it's one of the more odd things here. That request for approval goes in. And then he says, um, did you see his blink rate goes through the roof? And he his blink rate also flashes pretty hard when he says, I didn't want to be involved. Now, never mind. The guy's in your basement. You thought he's in your basement. Okay, Mark, you can come to my house. If you kill somebody, just clean up, please. Yeah, exactly. Put him down in the basement. Yeah, everybody you'll, knows. Go about, you'll go about your business. Every, everybody, everybody, <laughs> come on, everybody knows that. This is another good example of feeding the wrong wolf, to use all those analogies people use about the good wolf and the bad wolf and which one you feed. This guy has been feeding the wrong wolf. It's clear. Chase, what do you got? Uh, so this is one of the rare times we actually see full question repetition. When we ask him about personal knowledge of the Zik case, he does a full question repetition. And when he's saying that Zik was de dead on the floor, he tries to socialize this awkward situation using 
facial and, and head movements like you were talking about, Greg. And this is total lack of normal baseline narration with hands. There's, it's gone. And then it's just went about his day, you know, just like anybody else would after they just step over a dead body on their floor. And there's a lot of hesitancy here. He's not known for hesitancy. So we're seeing a lot of deviation from baseline. Now, when he's saying I went about business and he was gone, there's vocal hesitancy there. Hiding time or missing time, whatever you want to call it, it is pretty good. And there's a large eyebrow flash like Greg, you were talking about. A small shift to internal dialogue, which I won't really dig into. But here's the crux of this. Here's the most important thing to take away with from this. This is a normal part of his story because it's normal for him. If there was a body and he didn't kill it, he wouldn't care. I don't think it would have emotionally affected him. And I think he believes, just like everybody else, we tend to think other people are just like us. And that's one of our biggest mistakes when we interrogate people, when we influence other people, we automatically assume everybody's like me. You know, like that's why some some guys get their wives like uh, chainsaws for their for a Christmas gift or something like that. I want to give them what I want to get. As a quick footnote, he was diagnosed by multiple psychologists with antisocial personality disorder. And there's a lot more on that to come in the next video. Scott, what do you got? All right. Uh, Once again, we see this shallow affect displayed as he talks about waking up and finding a body in the living room. Doesn't bother him. Doesn't seem to bother him. He talks about it like it was something normal. For example, if he, he talks about like I walked in and this one guy sleep on the couch and there's a bunch of dirty clothes there in the, in the floor, a bunch of dirty laundry. It's like nothing to him. He's not showing the emotions you should show or you would expect one to show in this if it really did happen. Um, and they experienced that. We're not seeing any of that at all, not even a little bit. Um, the, again, this goes back to my theory of the, of the difference in a, a clinical psychopath and the one who has uh, amygdala damage or or damage to the limbic system somehow um he he doesn't something and the difference in in the clinical psychopath they may attempt to show some kind of 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 emotion during this because they know they should they've been watching other people they don't understand uh, what emotions are so over the years they watch them and they mimic them he's not even mimicking here so i think there's not that part of his brain that's why i don't think he's the the born this way i think something happened to him because he doesn't even try to mimic that he doesn't try to to pretend it's normal or or not normal he doesn't have the the facial expressions that show and that came in and this guy was dead on the nothing he shows no emotion whatsoever whatsoever in there in that so for me in this situation there's no rational thinking or thinking that a rational person would do when those emotions should be shown we're not we're not seeing those i don't think he thinks that way all right mark all right. what do you got all right Sorry, uh, yeah, so social behavior, social behavior. And, and there's been some nights, you know, where you, you go to bed and you get up the next morning, you go downstairs and you're kind of climbing over bodies and, you know, you, you check to see that, you know, people are OK. Uh, and then, yeah, you go about your business, you go off to work and you kind of hope they'll have been gone by lunchtime and their hangover overs have disappeared. You know, you kind of hope um, in his particular case. Uh, you know, if it were me and I'm climbing over bodies and one of them's dead, like that would be the point where you then do not go about your business. You know, it's all gone pear shaped clearly. And, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of ramifications, but the usual social responsibility is if somebody's dead, you have to deal with all of that, all of that stuff for him. Yes. It's odd, isn't it? Uh, had a drink, went to bed, dead people, dead person went about my business. That is antisocial. It's not the norm for, for a social society. Now, what really, for me, um, uh, pins this one down, and, and I always dislike seeing this, is bureaucratic behavior. We've had it in the numbers. We've had it in the way that he organizes things. And now you see him shuffling the papers. Now you see it's like the end of the news report. Shuffling, shuffling the papers. These are just papers. These are just you know, lists of numbers and, and things, things that died, things that I buried. Yeah. Very bureaucratic behavior. Again, a great example of this is not somebody you put in charge of countries. You don't let them be put in charge of anything where they're in charge of large amounts of human life. It's not going to go well, not going to go well at all. Shuffling those papers, massive red flag for me. Uh, just to just want to highlight on uh, um, uh, 
John Zick. You know, they want they want to make such an issue over John Zick mm -hmm. and his disappearance. I think he was killed for his car personally. And your and your personal knowledge of this of the Zick uh, uh, case then is uh, is uh, my what? personal knowledge of the Zick case is, is that I had come home and Zick and Rossi were at the house. I had a few drinks. I went to bed. When I woke up the, the next morning, Rossi was sleeping on the couch and Zick was dead on the floor. Uh, I went uh, about my own business and he was gone later on. And where, where did he go? Where did he end up? I assumed he ended up in the crawl space. You, did you see him being transported down there? No, wasn't present. Didn't do the, didn't do the transporting. But when he was dead, he was dead on the floor? He was dead on the floor, yes. And did you have a conversation with anybody about that? No. In other words, I, ju uh, I just kept my mouth shut because I didn't want to get involved. Mm -hmm. My idea was to just stay out of it. I was 19 when I ran away, and that was in, in 80, not 80, 60, 61. I went to Las Vegas for three months, took off, took my car and left. Yeah. I worked for Palm Mortuary being the night man picking up bodies at the hospitals and stuff for them. I worked as a night man only. I did have nothing to do with the bodies. All this talk that I slept with the dead ones or, or had sex with dead bodies, that there is no truth to any of that. You did live in the um, mortuary. I lived in the mortuary, yes, but not in the embalming room. I mean, they make it sound like, you know, I slept in the crypts with them. And I never climbed into a coffin or anything like that. That, that is so damn ridiculous. It, you know, it's the same thing. The contention is that I slept all night with Robert Peace. If you want to say I slept in the same house with a dead body, okay, fine, I'll, I'll buy that. But in the same room, no. And besides, the dead won't bother you. It's the living you got to worry about. All right, Greg, what do you got? I'm going to just have a few. There's a, This is a, a heyday. This is one of the creepiest things we're going to see ever, ever, ever in all the things we watch. And we've seen some doozies. There's more right eye accessing as he's recalling facts even though he's saying and denying when he's talking about having sex with dead bodies and that kind of stuff he's nervous smile shows up and it's out of baseline you think well that's pretty creepy until he outright laughs and a lot of people will do a nervous laugh to push away to distance away from things they don't realize they're doing it it's just all out nervous laughter and he has no idea how creepy that is because he continues to dig a hole he says well, you know, I might have slept in the house with a dead body, but not in the room with a dead body. Well, I don't think the whole contention that you were sleeping with the body had anything to do with the fact he's dead in your house. I think there's more more connotation here than we're hearing. And then here again is one of those what we feed, we become. This guy has thought for so long it's normal to do the kind of goofy stuff he's done, the horrific stuff he's done, that it's become normal and every day for him. I think he shows disappointment that we can go back and look at the rest it's disdain or something in his lower face when he screws up the date that disappoints him we're back to a control personality and that disappoints him and we can go back and look at the rest of those and then the only time i see a request for approval is when he's saying the contention is i slept in the house with this guy or in the bed with this guy okay i may have slept in the house but i didn't do the other and then he says that the dead are not the dangerous ones the living are and we certainly know that by talking to him. I'll leave it at that and say, Scott, what do you got? All right, we're bit back to the big head illustrations. And he sounds like a child when he's talking about the accusations of sleeping with dead bodies. That's, I mean, the smiles and the laughter and the eye contact while he's discussing this are what nightmare movie characters are made out of. This is, this. you see this one on those horrible movies where, where you see just, the, and what they do is juxtapose that normal um, behavior against just, creep factor 10 and that's what we're seeing here then, then to jump from one sentence like you were saying greg to the, where he's where he's using human stuff for the first time we actually see it to, to uh to uh to an explanation this is the first time we actually see concern on him or an expression of concern where his focus is that and uh the these behaviors just don't go together not not at all except in a horror movie that's the only time you'll see him chase what do you got I honestly believe that his denial about sleeping with them is truthful, but none of the other stuff is. In, in, in many cases, an interrogator might make a false claim that's unrelated to the crime to get a baseline of truthful denial behavior 
So I, I may be talking to somebody that's charged with $10,000 of theft, and I may talk about human trafficking onto that to get what a truthful denial it should look like out of that person. While he was working at this mortuary, several staff members reported that he did have an un, what they called an unusual fascination with the bodies. No one uh, suggested that it was of a sexual nature. But I think Gacy is a, a quintessential example of Dr. Pincus's formula theory, where uh, he has all these things. These, there's three things that make a perfect psychopath or that make a, a quintessential psychopath. And this is abuse, men, mental illness, and brain injury. And that, according to Dr. Pincus, it's P-I-N-K-U-S. I'll put a link in the, in the description right below us here. They make a serial killer. And his bizarre behavior was never really explained. But after his execution on request by Dr. Morrison, uh, his brain was examined. They found no trace of abnormalities whatsoever. So he does have... A, uh, psychological and physical abuse, mental illness, an early childhood brain injury. And as a bonus to add on to that, he had something called Kleinfelter syndrome. And Kleinfelter syndrome is also called 47XXY, which is there's an XXY when it should be an XY on the 47th chromosome. Long story. You can look it up if you want. But even after testing this, having this syndrome makes you more prone to to more serious crimes. And this is even after adjusting for socioeconomic variables like education, father figures, cohabitation, all that kind of stuff. That makes people more likely for sexual abuse, arson, murder, et cetera. And the Kleinfelter syndrome is something that, that was confirmed he did have. So he had the perfect storm of all three of those things, plus a genetic predisposition to violence and psychopathy. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I would say he knows that he's going into the most antisocial behavior when he starts telling the story about the, the mortuary. And I think I, I detect that from his laughter because he protests too much. He's laughing so far out of his usual baseline here that that from my point of view, I would say he's utterly trying to distract from what we know. Look, most people have come across killing other people, murder, it's, it's, but interfering with dead bodies, that's quite an extreme. Also, the, the, the human body, when dead, has almost zero power. And so what a great way to exert power over something with no power. Now, he also has a confounded and frustrating logic around this. Uh, he says nothing to do with the bodies. But before that, he said picking up the bodies and stuff for them. Well, if picking if it's if it's about nothing to do with the bodies, and that is not a picking up the bodies is a. So you can't have both at the same time. It's just logically impossible. He's confounded in the logic. He's frustrated by that. Uh, I worked only as the night. Uh, as the as the uh, the night man, I worked as the night man only. So that would suggest that um, if there's interference with bodies, that's got to be done by a day person. Clearly, you know, if I if look, I was only there at night. I was only there at night. Uh, so I kind of interfered with them. Well, no, you're more likely to have had less people around to see you. I, I grant you, Chase, that that maybe others didn't see him having any kind of sexual relationship with 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 bodies because they weren't there at night when he was the only person there. And just like Savile, we get we get a whole bunch of uh, of possibility there of of how can you have the most power over another human being while interfering with them when they're dead. It's a huge power play. And therefore it's antisocial because we know that, you know, if a human being has lived a life, they're at the least power when they're dead. And so they need protecting around that because people would take advantage of that. And so we have all kinds of social lessons around how you deal with dead people, what you do with dead people and what you don't do with dead people. He's breaking the rules. That's antisocial personality disorder. Absolutely. Confounding those rules. Yeah, that's all I got on that one. He's an odd guy. I'll give him that. He's very odd. I was 19 when I ran away, and that was in, in 80, not 80, 60, 61. I went to Las Vegas for three months.
took off, took my car and left. Yeah. I worked for Palm Mortuary, being the night man picking up bodies at the hospitals and stuff for them. I worked as a night man only. I did have nothing to do with the bodies. All this talk that I slept with the dead ones or, or, or had sex with dead bodies, there is no truth to any of that. You did live in the um, mortuary. I lived in the mortuary, yes, but not in the embalming room. I mean, they make it sound like, you know, I slept in the crypts with them. And I never climbed into a coffin or anything like that. That, that is so damn ridiculous. It, you know, it's the same thing. The contention is that I slept all night with Robert Peace. If you want to say I slept in the same house with a dead body, okay, fine, I'll, I'll buy that. But in the same room, no. And besides, the dead won't bother you. It's the living you got to worry about. <laughs> I, I have a lot of things that I've forgotten that I can't remember. For instance, I can go back to my childhood and stuff, and I still remember that, but yet you can, I can go into the 70s, and there are a lot of things I can't remember. The same thing with the victims. I've looked at all of, I don't know if, if you notice here, we got pictures of every one of the victims here. And believe it or not, for the last 12 years, I've studied these photos of the victims. And there is no, uh, we, we have a shot of all of the victims together here. And uh, when you look over at the, the photos, I have no recollection of any of them. Never met them. And we've gone over this more than once. They're just names and faces. And when you, when you look at them, uh, the thing of it is, we took it a step further. We went into their backgrounds. I wanted to know where they were at, what schools they attended, who they hung out with, and what kind of activities they were into. And that's what we dug up on each one of the victims. But still, there is no association. None of them never worked for me. None of them, they never went to any places that I ever hung around because I didn't hang, hang around that many places unless you were involved in politics or, or you, if you were involved in clowning, then I might have ran into you. But there's no way I could have run into any of them. All right, Greg, what do you got? I'm not going to cover a whole lot. I'm just going to tell you, uh, this is among the creepiest things I've ever seen. This is a trophy case for this guy. That's the reason he is hands all over he's Gollum, and this is the precious that's all this is this guy's got his hands all over this when he's flipping to show you his trophies look at his face just pay attention to this guy change in his cadence look i don't know any of these i'm gonna tell you why i don't know them and then he flips to them well come on these are murdered children most of them some were adults i think but murdered children he's flipping to it with glee there's no look this is a sad thing there's none of that this is a trophy for him and then he's got this brow up as he says unless you're in politics or clowning i wouldn't know them that's a request for approval these are victims and he never says one time i did not kill any of these people he said i didn't know them their faces and names that's one of the sickest things i've seen in this entire thing chase what do you got he starts with his memory loss statement and rolls right into the photos just citing that he has no memory of meeting them so he says I have memory loss. Let me just put that out there and then talk about some more memory loss. I think it's interesting that he marks the page and continues to flip while he talks. The page is marked by his ring finger. So it's like the page is marked with a finger. And then he's looking through the book and finally decides to flip to that. It's marked the whole time. He has it marked. I don't know why that is. If you do, let me know in the, in the comments. I, I'm going to read them. In court... Gacy's defense argued for this serious mental impairment after these uh, APD diagnoses were received from all these psychologists. And the court didn't really buy the story about impulse behavior, citing, and I quote, if Gacy had 33 irresistible impulses, just how was it that he dug the graves in advance, which, which they which they proved. And going back, just to give you one more interesting fact about this, and Mark, you were talking about this earlier, in his vehicle, they found a radio and a police, a magnetic police siren, and figured out that he regularly posed as a police officer, which would almost, just knowing how human beings respond to perceived authority, he would almost have carte blanche to get anybody he wanted to, A, into handcuffs, or B, to get into the car and take him where he wanted to take him. That's all I got. Scott? All right. I agree with you guys. And uh, Greg, you're right. This uh, search for victim information is a, is a form of trophy exhibition. That, that, that's all it is. Sometimes a serial killer will take 
as a what they call a trophy when they take a finger or they'll take hair or they'll take photos or a piece of clothes you know clothing something like that and that's their trophy and it, it, it triggers the memory of the horror they brought on this person or whatever they get from it the the, the excitement from it and so that's why i'll take those things uh and the rest is just an excuse he used the excuse for saying, I didn't know these people. I can prove it. I looked at them. I don't know who any of these people are. How, I never came in contact with any of them. Goes to your thing, Chase. If he, or yeah, if he was pulling people over, or Mark, who said the siren thing? Was that you, Mark? No, it was, uh, Chase. That was me. Okay. If he was doing that, yeah, of course, he'd never see, he'd have no reason to be, to be connected with them before. And I mean, that that's crazy. So that's the only reason he, he would bring that up, I think, in the first place is for to, to show he had nothing to do with him, but I think it's tro- trophy exhibition. That's that's all it is. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, believe it or not, he says. And yeah, this is something from Ripley's Believe It or Not. This is Madame to Swords quality kind of horror we've got here. One thing that I find quite strange is we've been over this more than once. We've been, I still don't understand who the we is. I can't work out whether he's socializing this, whether he does have some partner involved or people involved in making this this book that he's, that he's got there. Um, or there's some other persona there alongside him. I'm not sure. Um, They're just names and faces when you look at them. They're just names and faces when you look at them. So back to that bureaucratic piece. Uh, We took it a step further, he says, and uh, because I wanted to know. So he's kind of saying, I've investigated me better than anybody else and found me innocent uh, of, of most all of these, apart from the ones that, that I'm not innocent of. It still confounds me as to why he wants to distance himself from some but not all of these crimes. I can't work out what his plan is around that. The, it seems to me from what I've heard, there can be no sentence reduction. There can be no appeal. Um, you know, other than it is a it is a classic of antisocial uh, personality disorder that that they can downplay and upplay things in bizarre manners and and twist and turn those. Number one to to be manipulative and two because that's the way they see the world that day because they're not conforming to our usual sociological norms. So it could be it could be that. Um, yeah, that's all I got on this one. He's a He's about as strange as we've ever had. I, I have a lot of things that I've forgotten that I can't remember. For instance, I can go back to my childhood and stuff, and I still remember that, but yet you can, I can go into the 70s, and there are a lot of things I can't remember. The same thing with the victims. I've looked at all of, I don't know if, if you notice here, we got pictures of every one of the victims here. And believe it or not, for the last 12 years, I've studied these photos of the victims. And there is no... Uh, we, we have a shot of all of the victims together here. And uh, when you look over at the, the photos, I have no recollection of any of them. Never met them. And we've gone over this more than once. They're just names and faces. And when you, when you look at them, uh, the thing of it is, we took it a step further. We went into their backgrounds. I wanted to know where they were at, what schools they attended, who they hung out with, and what kind of activities they were into. And that's what we dug up on each one of the victims. But still, there is no association. None of them never worked for me. None of them, they never went to any places that I ever hung around because I didn't hang, hang around that many places unless you were involved in politics or, or you, if you were involved in clowning, then I might have ran into you. But there's no way I could have run into any of them. All right, well, let's throw around the room and uh, very quickly, 30 seconds or less, tell what we think about this case or this guy. And uh, then we'll wrap it up. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I I would say um, there's a lot of calm around stuff, but then just go to that moment where he just starts laughing around the interference with uh, with uh, in the mortuary. That's quite a big differential. I only point that out because those are the kind of big differentials that we're often looking for to go, well, what's that about? Why be so calm here around dead people? And then why be laughing at these dead people over here? What's going on there? So great differential there. Chase. 
Yeah, I agree. I think this this whole thing was just a, a it's an example of a perfect storm of everything coming together that could possibly manufacture a psychopath all happening as it as it possibly could. And he becomes a horror movie level psychopath. In fact, they do make movies about him. And that's that's really what we're seeing here. And I think this he had a dissociative capacity that was present. So anybody, most people that are have any kind of abuse in childhood become good at dissociating and removing themselves from events. And I think him just having that little bit of capacity made him use that as a defense in trial. But it was absolutely, in my opinion, not the case. There was no dissociation. There was some alter ego he named Jack, I think, that was responsible for some of these crimes, which is not the case. But he used his capacity for dissociation as a defense. Greg? Yeah, Mark, to your point, when you say you wonder why he's doing this, I think because he needs to be admired for something. And even if it, that is something horrific, he needs to be admired. That's the reason he's willing to say, I've done these, but not these. I didn't sleep with dead people. I'm not a homosexual. The things that he's drawn a line in his mind matter, he separates himself from. And if you want evidence, he needs admiration. Met Rosalind Carter, was tied up in politics, was tightly tied to the Polish festival, drove that. This, I think the clown thing was more about admiration than the other piece. So when I see that and I see the control pieces, yeah, whatever made him a psychopath, thank God there are not many of them like him because we know 33 people died as a result of him and he's gone out of lethal injection. But what a horrific story. And you can see how calmly he talked about it, just like I said with the cooking oil story. That's what he's doing. And he rolled around in something so he would look and smell like normal people and be able to pick up his, his victims. He says, and some of it is verifiably not true, that he didn't know any of these people. There's one of the guys who was working for him who came up missing, which is what started all this thing. So, you know, he casually, he's comfortable with lying and arbitrarily altering the truth to fit him just so he can be admired. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I think this is a great example, in my opinion, of the psychopath, the differences in a psychopath being born and one being creative, how be creative, however he's been creative. And I think it's, it's a, it, the whole thing, you're right, it makes great movies. It makes a fantastic movie and it's it's all set up it's got the clown stuff the things that scare us as a kid even though it's supposed to make us happy as a kid as an adult clown scares to death so i think it's a great example of the juxtaposing the the created one by the one that, that's born that way uh in my opinion so all right fellas i think this is a good one and we'll see you next time see you around Yeah, I don't know why I guess I don't know.